Welcome to FNC Preschool Agriculture 101 Fall Lead Science Webinar. We are so excited to have you join us today. A few items to make note of this morning before we begin. All attendees will be muted for the duration of the webinar. We will have time for a Q&A at the end of the presentation. And due to the large number of attendees this morning, we will run our Q&A through the chat option. Therefore, if you do have a question at any time throughout the presentation, please click on the dialog window at the bottom of your screen and type your question into the chat. We will keep to our promise of 45 minutes for this presentation. So if we don't get to all the questions, we apologize and please reach out to us after the event. I also wanna mention that this webinar is being recorded and will be made available on our preschool website. With those details out of the way, I would like to introduce our presenters this morning. Jordan Breesbaugh is an FMC product manager based in Gravelburg, Saskatchewan. He has more than five years experience working with growers in Southern Saskatchewan and on his family farm. Jordan will bring together the weed science results while connecting them back to in-field scenarios to highlight insights on fall weed pressure and what that means to you. Rachel Evans is the, tech, the FMC technical sales agronomist for Southern Saskatchewan and Manitoba. She brings her strong academic and consulting background in the areas of plant and soil science to help provide solutions for FMC farm customers. And our last but not least presenter today is Nolan Kowalczyk. He is the FMC technical sales agronomist for Northern Saskatchewan and Alberta. Nolan has served growers for the last 25 years on the retail, wholesale and manufacturing sides of the crop protection business. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Jordan Breesbaugh to start things off this morning. Hi, thanks Carmen. Carmen, you can hear me, I'm assuming? You are good to go. Excellent. Um, just one little piece of housekeeping. Um, we are currently maxed out for attendees. Carmen is gonna send out a note here. So uh, great to, to see so many people uh, taking the time this morning and we really appreciate it. So our agenda today is going to be as follows. So um, a few of you are probably curious what preschool is. So we're gonna give you our, our mandate and our vision with, with preschool. We're going to give you a brief introduction to sort of set the table with a discussion on winter annuals, perennials, biennials, and some fall application tips. And then we'll move into sort of the belly of the presentation, uh, fall as part of integrated weed management. And, you know, I just want to qualify and say that there, you know, obviously we, we weren't able to cover everything in our time here, uh, but we do have a pretty robust uh, set of information to, you know, pass along and hopefully uh, you, everybody on the call finds some value. And uh, we'll wrap that piece up with the, a quick analysis of working field days in the fall versus the spring. So what's our mandate and vision? So I, I want to start with um, just talking about what preschool is. At FMC in Canada, we view um, ourselves as a bit of a leader in the pre-emergent uh, space, whether it's uh, burn-off or extended weed control products. And really our mandate today is preschool is our education and stewardship extension of FMC Canada. It's our firm mandate is to just bring some value, educate growers, wholesalers, um, anybody in the industry a bit on some proactive weed control and resistance management best practices. And something that I want to highlight about today's presentation is it's going to be product agnostic. So what that means is uh, you're not going to see a lot of, well, you'll see zero information on any of our actual products. Um, you won't see us calling out uh, features and benefits on particular products. This is really just about us diving into um, some research that's available. I'll also highlight that the research you're going to see today, um, we've given proper credit to. It's not our research, it's research and our interpretation of the data that's out there. Um, and, and we believe that it's 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 really uh, interesting stuff and, and really great information for uh, for anybody out there. So I wanna talk a little bit about our preschool faculty to sort of set the table. So preschool, our faculty that puts together this presentation um, is really a collaboration of everybody across Western Canada in different, different fields. So at the top is myself, um, and then you know to my right uh, in that picture, Nolan and Rachel, who are our technical sales manager, uh, very well-educated, very experienced people in the field. The next row, uh, we get input from our account managers. Dana Singbeal is our area's manager for the Swift Current East region. Travis Gable is our account manager for the Saskatoon region. Brian O'Hara is our account manager in the Lethbridge re region. And then our support team who really do make these things tick, you just heard from Carmen, our communications officer, um, and Krista Henry as well, who's our, our Marcom director for uh, FMC. So they really make these slides and really bring these presentations to life. And Kate Mercer on the bottom left-hand corner 
works for our creative agency who also collaborates with us as part of this team. So it's really about bringing different perspectives to the information. And with that, the next piece of the presentation will be uh, presented by Nolan and Rachel. So I will pass the baton. Thanks, Jordan, and good morning. To start things off, we're gonna spend a few minutes talking about the importance of weed biology as it relates to weed management. As the days get shorter here and temperatures start to decline, this is triggering biennial and perennial weeds to move carbohydrates from their leaves down into their root systems. This storage of sugars is what's preparing them to overwinter and gives them the energy that they need to um, fill out their reproductive habits next spring. Applying systemic herbicides at this time can take advantage of this downward movement to transport the herbicides down into the roots, often improving the level of control. Winter annuals, on the other hand, tend to just be germinating at this time, forming rosettes to overwinter. This fall establishment allows them to get going early next spring once temperatures warm back up, but this is usually well before any equipment is moving and uh, given the head start, you know, it's making them more difficult to control uh, later in the spring. Management of these weeds is gonna be really important to get all crops off to a good start, but it becomes especially important as we think about our more uncompetitive crops, especially those that have relatively few herbicide options in crop. So that's what, you know, making this fall timing even more important. Next slide. An open fall with decent moisture, can also mean higher recruitment of winter annuals. So don't want to jinx it, but looking like, you know, we're potentially headed into this kind of scenario this year. Unlike some perennials that spread by their roots, winter annual weeds generally reproduce by seed. So a weed like nearly hawksbeard can generate up to 50,000 seeds per plant under ideal conditions. And then those, wheat, those seeds are spread by the wind, making them prolific um, of their prevalence in the, in the countryside. Cleavers can act like a spring or winter annual weed, but when acting like a winter annual, they quickly can get past that three to four rural stage, which is generally gonna be the cutoff for our herbicide timing. So having winter annual weeds means that they can quickly um, you know, render our, our herbicides ineffective by next spring, especially when we get into our, our seeding timings. And then something like stinkweed, um, you know, definitely more problematic for uncompetitive crops because you know, something like this is forming dense mats of rosettes, um, which can be drying up moisture and nutrients, which is something that we will be covering off later in the presentation. So I'm gonna pass it over to Nolan next. Good morning, everybody. It's Nolan Kowalczyk here. So <clears throat> just wanted to just talk a little bit more kind of on some of these perennials and biennials. And <clears throat> to the left here, you'll see a source here from the Saskatchewan Weed Survey. And basically this is from 2003 on the left-hand side, and then kind of showing the relative abundance of these uh, different weeds from showing up in the most recent survey in 2014 and 2015. And, you know, what this weed survey really is doing, these different weed surveys across Western Canada is providing a snapshot of, of weed presence and distribution um, across geographies and just showing the relative abundance or, or, or decrease in abundance of these weeds from, you know, period to period. And as you'll see here, you know, green foxtail, you know, wild oats have remained relatively abundant throughout the years uh, and prevalent, wild buckwheat, you know, volunteer canola, you know, we don't think of it sometimes as a winter annual, but, you know, as a winter annual, it has increased. And sometimes at this time, if, if frost hasn't hit it, dealing with volunteer canola does become a, a good time now to manage it, being able to, to decrease the potential or reduce the threats of insects and flea beetles and hosting diseases and so forth um, next spring. And as we kind of move down the list here, you know, Canada thistle, spiny annual south thistle, you know, cleavers is a winter annual, um, you know, lambs quarters, narrow leaf hawksbeard, 
uh, perennials and biennials and, and so forth and dandelion. And so, you know, looking at these perennials and biennials specifically, you know, we're going to talk a bit more, but generally a post-harvest application is providing a, a really good time as, you know, Rachel talked about the systemic movement of nutrients and if we can apply systemic herbicides to take advantage of that translocation, uh, we get a far more efficacious um, uh, control fall versus spring applied. And so this little graph here in the middle is just showing the percentage of dandelion control that's been assessed. Um, so we have here in the, uh, the the dark green line glyphosate that was applied at a one liter per acre in the spring versus glyphosate that was applied as a one liter per acre in the fall in the light uh, colored bar. And as you'll see here, the percentage of control on the left hand side, the glyphosate applied as a one liter acre in the fall is definitely far more efficacious as the glyphosate that's applied is a one liter in the spring. And it's because of that translocation, because of the cooler temperatures and the plants taking down nutrients that we see that, that better efficacy. And this is the same results that we find in our research, our internal research with fall versus spring applied with glyphosate at a half liter plus, you know, several different systemic herbicides when we're trying to battle some of the uh, targets like uh, weed targets like dandelion and uh, white cockle and so forth. Next slide, please. And so just to provide, I guess, the group here on the, on the uh, chat or on the uh, webinar, just a few other key fall application uh, tips. I think right now as we're progressing through harvest and a lot of geographies, other geographies, you know, maybe getting close to done and some geographies done, apply to actively growing weeds when you're considering a post-harvest application. You know, weeds damage at harvest do need some time to accumulate new tissue. And this is essential really for herbicide uptake and efficacy to make sure that you're going to get proper proper control. And, you know, rule of thumb is kind of, you know, try target six inches, give or take, of new growth as kind of a, you know, a, a quick rough guide. You know, we are starting to get a few cooler conditions here. We had a light frost in, in, in Airdrie this morning. So spring after a frost, <clears throat> frost damage weeds are, are not healthy and will not uptake the, the herbicide that you're choosing. So try to delay your spring, you know, if the leaf tissues are blackened, browned, dark green, you know, these are signs of cold temperature damage. So you need to kind of wait, let that plant recover. The leaf should be a vibrant green, shiny, pliable, and, and try to look for some, some new growth. And just some other timing and weather conditions, you know, generally recommend, you know, application by October 1st for, you know, glyphosate value added products. So additives that you're putting in with, with glyphosate to increase efficacy. So prior to uh, recommend application by October 1st and before snowfall, prior to freeze up and before snowfall for extended control soil applied products. You know, spray in the late morning, these value add glyphosate products or afternoon when the temperatures are warmer and the heavy dew is off the plant. And ideally apply when the temperatures are above 10 degrees Celsius and rising on days uh, with predicted highs above 15 degrees Celsius or more. And, you know, bright sunny conditions, you know, do help for moving the herbicides at translocation to the roots. And so with that, I'll turn it back over to uh, Jordan. So the next part of the presentation, we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, a multitude of different things and, and really, you know, we weren't able to touch on all topics. For example, um, you, we weren't able to dive into harvest weed seed destruction again, such a, there's so many important things I believe as you know with fall as part of integrated weed management that you know maybe go beyond uh, herbicides but our focus is obviously going to be on some of that that weed mass and and you know potential for herbicide application what it can mean. So the first question we pose is how does fall weed removal impact weed biomass in the spring? So I want to draw your attention to this graph on the right. It's from uh, two professors down in uh, from the University of Missouri who were looking at weed biomass and one of the first observations they make in this study is that weed biomass is highest in the fall and as Nolan and Rachel have just demonstrated you know those winter annual or weeds and uh, they're there they're removing soil moisture and they're taking away nutrients and so they also noted in this study that the weed biomass is the highest in the fall 
but they also noted that weed biomass is significantly reduced when a pre-emergent is sprayed in the fall or 60 days pre-plant. And when you look at the fall and 60 days pre-plant, the light gray bar represents an untreated application and you can see the high amount of weed biomass in grams per half meter squared. And you can also see the glyphosate alone treatment. When you look at the fall application of an extended weed control product and a burn plus a burn off product, you can see that the weed biomass is significantly reduced. And you might be thinking, well, Jordan, yeah, but seven days pre-plant actually has better results. And really for us, this is really just highlights that there's there you can significantly reduce that weed biomass by having that fall application. And this is really, you know, speaking to the importance of you know, even if you do that fall application, that that spring burnoff is still a really necessary part. And again, keep in mind the viewpoint we want to see here is that fall application, as far as lowering weed biomass, is just one part of the puzzle. The last remark I make on this slide is that the researchers also noted that applications of glyphosate and 2,4-D alone resulted in the same weed biomass as the untreated check in the spring. So again, sometimes it's a little bit about timing, it's about the right mode of action and, and efficacious modes of action as well. But this is really speaking to the, you know, how that fall application can help really bring down that weed biomass. So in this same study, they found that winter annual weed emergence was negligible in extended control pre-herbicide applications. So I'll draw your attention again to the, to the graph on the right. And if you look at the top where it talks about total winter annuals, you'll notice that the number of merged, emerged plants per half meter squared in the blue bars is significantly lower with those two products on the left versus glyphosate and untreated. So again, highlighting that that application in the fall really does bring down that winter annual population. You'll also note that in the summer annuals and the weeds that they're, they're drawing attention to, the red bar represents water hemp which is a, obviously a weed that's jumping onto everybody's radar, you know, particularly Southern Saskatchewan and Manitoba where it is crossing the border. Um, and there are other parts that are observing this, but you'll notice that even the summer annual numbers of emerged plants per half meter squared are brought down. So in, by no means am I saying, hey, you know, go ahead, spray in the fall. You won't have to do a burn off and you know, you won't have to, you'll, you, won't, you might not even have to do an in-crop. Uh, we're certainly not recommending that Again, we're just highlighting here that fall is just one part of that integrated weed management story. So then we pose the question, how does fall weed removal impact soil nutrients? And for today's exercise, we're really only going to talk about one nutrient in particular, which is it's the biggest macronutrient. It's, it's a really expensive part of uh, farming, as we all know. But winter annual weeds are responsible for the loss of many key nutrients, but in particular nitrogen. In a 2017 Kansas State University study, you know, across 14 different sites, the average nitrogen uptake from winter annual weeds was 16 pounds of nitrogen per acre. So that's, a, you know, again, when you start to think about 16 pounds per acre, you know, maybe that doesn't seem like a very big number right off the hop, but it, it can result in pretty significant dollars. Where those winter annual weeds were controlled, the crops planted the following spring obviously had more readily available soil nitrogen. And Separate findings from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln substantiated that, finding very similar numbers at 15 and a half to 16 pounds. So let's go through a quick scenario. The current price of nitrogen in July of 2020, when we were kind of working to build this slide deck, and again, I'm giving you the South Central SAS price, so I don't want you know retailers calling me and blowing up my phone. Where was that price? Uh, you know that that price was from a couple months ago at $463 per metric ton. What that equates to is 21 cents per pound for nitrogen. And if we now understand that the cost to the grower is 16 pounds per acre loss due to winter annual weeds that take up that moisture, we, you know, we can kind of make a rough dollarization of what that cost is due to overwintering weeds. So again, you'll see $3.36 per acre. And again, lots of variables here. So you know, don't hold my feet to the fire too much, but, you know, understanding that the price of nitrogen changes, you know, the weed pressure could be, you know, down significantly. Um, you know, again, this is, you know, looking at some of those, those results and trying to dollarize them, to, you know, to really highlight, you know, what the effect it could be on a farm. 
So in a similar study, the University of Nebraska identified that 800 pounds of water is required to produce one pound of winter annual weed biomass. And Dr. Bradley and Monig further confirmed that a fall application of a pre-emergent herbicide resulted in 10% more volumetric soil moisture one week after planting and 39% more than the untreated. So I'll highlight some results here on the bottom. If you look at the fall application of, for example, Cymazine in 2,4-D, one week after planting, there was 53% volumetric soil moisture. So again, we're talking about a critical time, particularly in Western Canada, where we can go through dry spells. And I think, you know, with the exception of a few places in Western Canada, the last four or five seasons have really been quite dry. And you'll note that if with a fall application of glyphosate in 2,4-D, um, that's your 10% drop from the cymazine 2,4-D application. And in the untreated, you know, a pretty significant check of 39% uh, less volumetric soil moisture at one week after planting. So again, critical time for plant growth and germination and, uh, you know, a lot less soil moisture due to weeds that overwinter. So let's go through a quick moisture loss scenario. Let's say that a field has 500 pounds per acre of winter annual biomass at planting, which is, you know, for today's exercise is slightly above average. And we just, you know, showed you some data that says that 800 pounds of water is required for one pound of weed biomass. So what does that equate to? Works out to 47,920 gallons of water, which is equivalent to one and three quarter acre inches of soil water used by those particular weeds. Why is that important? We just pulled this graph on September 10th, which is from Agri-Food Canada, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, and it is the departure from average precipitation in millimeters. And as you'll notice, a large portion of Western Canada right now is anywhere from 100 to 75 or 125 to 100 less millimeters per rain than the average. So when we look through even parts of Manitoba, which is historically uh, has more moisture, parts of Southern Saskatchewan and through Central Saskatchewan, and you can see that um, Alberta's moisture is definitely improved, um, being slightly above average in, in most places, um, but again, not overwhelmingly high precipitation numbers. So all of a sudden it becomes very important to preserve that soil moisture. And then let's go through another quick scenario. And again, you know, keep in mind, I'm dollarizing, you know, diesel is probably being dollarized a little high here. Um, but let's assume it costs a dollar per liter of diesel for easy math. And it takes 14.63 liters per acre of irrigation fuel to build one inch of soil moisture. If we multiply that by the one and three quarter inch per acre of water to recover that moisture loss to net zero, for 500 pounds of weed, per acre of weed biomass it could cost you up to 25 just about 26 dollars per acre to recover that soil moisture lost so again you know lots of different variables here different you know lots of things that can go up or down but again i think really just highlighting that there is a cost to those winter annual weeds so the next question becomes how does it impact some of those other soil conditions? So the fall removal of winter annual weeds species facilitate an earlier spring planting by accelerating the soil warming and drying process. So for example, Dalkey found that soil temperature increased by as much as two degrees Celsius in corn and by as much as five degrees Celsius in soybeans the following spring. So again, why does that matter? And again, I, I understand there's not a bowl load of corn acres in Western Canada. Um, so we would make the equivalent more to a taller crop, let's say uh, a cereal, cereal stubble or canola stubble, which would be more prevalent here in Western Canada. And, you know, we can equate soybeans, which are, you know, probably more suited to our field pea lentil. And we do have, you know, a higher amount of soybeans in, in certain geographies. But when you start to think about why does that matter? Obviously, everybody on this call would be aware that that soil borne disease risk increases in certain crops planted in cold, wet soil that's less than 10 degrees Celsius in temperature. Uh, soybeans in particular really like to be in a, a warmer soil. So if that soil, if there's winter annual weeds that allows that soil to warm up quicker, it means that it could give a grower a few more days in the spring to really uh, get that work done. And now I want to present a little information on how a fall weed management program can impact insect populations. So the first one that we're going to talk about, and the source here is the Canola, Canola Council of Canada, so they've got some great information. Um, 
Number one is cowworms. They serve as a, the greatest threat to canola crops really, and they're also an early season economic pest in other crops such as flax and lentils. I know in southern Saskatchewan this year we observed, I observed more cutworms than I'm used to seeing. In particular it was affecting flax crops, uh, but we also see it affect other crops like lentils. Winter annuals, such as stinkweed, volunteer canola, they're, they're a food host for many pests in the spring before seeding crop comes up. So really this is a two-part story with cutworms. Number one, certain types of cutworms, army and dinghy in particular, they hatch in the fall and their larvae feed on fall weed biomass and they make them more robust to overwinter. So essentially that life cycle starts in the fall, those insects will hatch. And if there's weeds available, because the crop is gonna be harvested, those insects, those cutworms will use that as a food source to make themselves more robust so that they maybe have a better chance to survive the winter. In Canada, we have this wonderful thing called winter and snow, which generally takes care of a lot of insect pressure. But if there is a really robust food source there, it makes it a little more likely that their population will survive through the winter. That fall herbicide application, as we demonstrated earlier in the presentation, really cuts back on the weed biomass that is observed out in the field. And what that means is when those cutworms overwinter, when they come out of that dormancy, when they, when they start to eat again in the spring, they will first go to the first available food source, which if those winter annual weeds are there, that will become what they use to grow their numbers and begin to do damage. So really fall weed management is, is a two part story as it relates to insects, in particular cutworms in that it provides a, a food source for them to really gain that constitution to survive the winter, but it also becomes the first food source to get them going in the spring. Similarly, the other major pest we see in Western Canada in the spring um, is flea beetles. So flea beetles, offspring of overwintered adults, feed on canola leaves, stems, pods, fall emerged weeds. Not only will the flea beetles use the, the weeds that are available as well to become more robust, but they will use them to overwinter, hide, they will use shelter belts, you know, volunteer cruciferous plants that, to survive those winter months. They appear again as adults in the spring and again use those available early weeds to feed until the host crops emerge. Again, a two-part story here in that those winter annuals, those volunteers that are coming up after harvest, they not only serve as a key food source in the fall for winter survival, but they also provide a refuge into which they can survive the winter cold. Again, lots of great information from the Canola Council of Canada as it, as it relates to this. You know, so then this is a tricky, uh, a trickier one, but just looking at, you know, how it, it is really complicated in farming, there's a lot of things going on. So wanted to bring to light some of the studies that are done um, in the US. So Rots and Harrigan, they, they had a model that examined various soil parameters, residues, suitable field day data, you know, across the Midwest and the US. And it's a really long set of data that they observed from 1966 to 2003. So really powerful data looking at um, different things. And I'll draw your attention to the chart on the right. And I, we really call out, you know, if you look at the different types of sand, which is, is really, or different types of soil, which again, for today's exercise, think about the difference in soils that we have in Western Canada. You know, we have some highly sandy areas. I know we farm in the sand. I, I make the joke um, this year when we were combining our lentils down in the mountains at Mancota that Mancota should put a sign up that says, you know, welcome, welcome to uh, Mancota, home of mountains and beach sand, because our, our sand down there has a high sand content and it's, it's very rolly. But you can see here, if you look at the suitable days in a higher sand area, you know, at 26.5 days in the spring and almost 60 in the fall. And we also recognize that, you know, this isn't Western Canadian data. Um, and certainly those fall days are, are somewhat limited. In Canada, we have this thing called, you know, snow and winter. So we certainly recognize that. And we also recognize that harvest is priority one. But across a, a multitude of different soil zones i think what we the takeaway here is there seems to be more time even over a really long study of you know over 30 years that indicates that there is you know a little larger window to complete work and there's also a lot less going on in the fall i know at the spring at our farm we're burning off we might be heavy harrowing um we're also seeding we're trying to get the drill in the ground as quickly as we can to capitalize on those days and hopefully get as much crop in before you know a nice spring rain settles in so we certainly recognize that, but it does appear that 
there are more suitable working days in, in the fall. The University of Missouri also found similar results as it relates to that. You know, they were they show that you know between March, April, and May, growers had 42 and a half days, you know, to complete again a lot of those operations I just talked about, you know, versus 57.8 days in September, October, and November. And you know, that represents you know close to two weeks difference. And again, I, I will qualify that. In Canada, we have different, uh, we have a much shorter growing season, so it really is priority one to get harvest done. But I think the takeaway here is that, you know, there does seem to be a few more days for the work to get completed in, in the fall. So just to give a little bit of a summary here, what are the benefits of a fall application? Really number one uh, at the top of the list is it reduces springweed biomass, resulting in more available moisture and nutrients for spring crops. So, you know, I think we demonstrated with some of the data that we showed that, you know, that fall application of a pre-emergent product and a burn-off product, you know, definitely doesn't solve all your product problems in the spring. There, it, It's really just one part of the story. But we also probably can appreciate at this point that the moisture and nutrients um, are being used by those weeds and a fall application can really uh, help you from a, you know, a dollar's perspective as well. From a nutrient perspective, you know, our team, we really wanted to go into de great detail, look at all the micros, uh, some of the macros, um, or all the macros and some of the micronutrients. But, you know, we really, for the sake of today's presentation, you know, we really just focused on nitrogen, but, and, you know, nitrogen is probably, if it isn't, it's probably the most expensive input on a farm in a year. Um, and we want that nitrogen available to, to growers, right? So um, their crops, uh, obviously they, they need that macro. And so I think we, you know, that fall application becomes critical in preserving that, that soil or that soil end. Enhanced control of winter annuals and other undesirable weeds make it less susceptible to overwintering detrimental insects. You know, I, I would say if you asked any grower almost to a man, if they said the application that they probably like doing the least, um, would be a, an insect application. Um, insects are, you know, opportunistic. And really a fall application is about getting rid of that environment, lowering the possibility that you have that problem. And, you know, hopefully, you know, potentially save you some money on an insect application, or even just the time to carry that out again during a really busy spring season. The fall generally, again, I'm not speaking on behalf of everybody. Um, I certainly recognize that, you know, the priority is harvest. Um, but, it, it, you know, it does appear, we've, we've shown some data to demonstrate that there appears to be a little more time in the fall versus spring to get, you know, some of that fall work done, uh, a herbicide application. Um, you know, I believe, again, a, a great opportunity. My dad has always said that um, fall is the, you know, the, the cheapest pass he makes all year. And it, you know, once harvest is done, it seems to be a little less, um, you know, you take your time more, you're at the end of the year, your harvest is complete. So, you know, for him and for our farm, it's always been a really important part of, of what we do. And again, you know, fall being just a small part of this integrated pest management and weed management, uh, it allows a bit of customization for your in-crop products, you know, to address weed pests at hand rather than a broad brush approach. So, you know, again, we demonstrated that that lower weed biomass, even on summer annuals, you know, would help with not only timing, but the selection of your in-crop products, whatever that might be. If you have a great catch with your fall application and it, you know, brings your population down of a particular weed, might allow you to put a different mode of action um, that really complements your burn off. And again, really become part of that, that whole story. With that, that is, comes to the end of our presentation. Thank you again for joining us this morning. Um, thanks again to the preschool faculty for all the time and effort that they put into this. That concludes the FMC Preschool Agriculture 101 Weed Science Webinar. On behalf of the FMC Preschool faculty, I'd like to thank you for taking the time to join us today. Please keep an eye out in early 2021 for Agriculture 201, brought to you by FMC Preschool.